Okay. Now that you use the toilet, everything we say, you gotta be careful, okay? Now it's on video. Okay. Any questions from last week for general questions? Okay. So today we're gonna go over, I'll give you a little brief, um, brief overview of civil procedures. So how civil cases are being handled in the court. I'll give you some examples of some pleading papers that we have done, that I personally have done. And uh, we're going to go into a tiny bit of process of how mediation or arbitration goes. Okay? So, let's start with a uh, personal injury matter. Okay? That's quite often. Two cars get into a collision. What do you do? So, uh, what kind of car do you drive? Mustang. Hmm? Mustang. Ooh, nice. What year? Uh, 2005. 2005 Mustang. What's the model, pre pre previous model, two model? Uh, 2004 was a different model. They added right, a design, right. yeah. Okay, so it's a new design. Good. And uh, Jessica, do you drive? Yeah. Wrong person. Uh, Christine, do you drive? Yeah, sure, Cobalt. Hmm? Chevy Cobalt. That's a small car. Yeah. Okay. So, all right. So I'll let Christine to be the good guy. To <laughs> here. So Christine nicely drives her car, 35 miles per hour, Sky Drive, perfectly under the speed limit. Okay. <laughs> and of course, um, Barry drives a Mustang, which is a muscle car. I was like, oh, you drive too slow. Whoever that's driving the car in front of me. So he started to drive aggressively. At a sharp turn, so basically he lost control and rear ended Christine. Okay? So, what do you think? 100% at fault, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, what's your thing? You have insurance. So, you have insurance and you have insurance in this case. So, what first thing you do is you call your insurance company, you call your insurance company, you file a claim, and your insurance, insurance company will come in and pay your medical bills fix your car, okay? If you want more, you call your lawyer, okay? So when you call your lawyer, what you get is you get your specific damage. When you say specific damage is your car repairs, your medical expenses, loss of wage. And then you have your general damage. Your general damage is your basically the fancy word of pain and suffering. Okay. Usually we, we multiply your specific damage times two, and that's your general damage. Okay. Any questions? Any questions about that? Okay. So now lawyers are involved. At this time, Barry, you don't hire a lawyer, right? Because you have your attorney. Oh, I'm sorry. You have your insurance company that handles everything. Christine, on the other hand, her insurance company paid her medical bills fix your car. But your insurance company is not going to help you to go after the general damage. So what do you do? You call a lawyer. The lawyer will help you to pursue to pursue this uh, general damage. Okay. Now, so at the end of your medical treatment, so the lawyer will put everything together into a demand letter, into a demand package, and they will be sent to various insurance company. And then there will be a couple months of negotiation. So for example, the medical bill is $2,000. The car repair is $1,000, $3,000. $1, okay? And then lawyers will be asking for $10,000. That's three times. And after a, a couple months of negotiations, then you'll get down to, well, $3,000, maybe we can get it for $5,000. And then we we'll settle the case. We we'll have the case settled. And then instead of $10,000, we have $5,000. Okay? Any questions? Any questions? Okay. Okay. Now, let's talk about the legal side. Okay. Now, let's talk about the legal side. Okay. Let's talk about the legal side. Okay. Now, 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 let's talk about the legal side. Okay. In the previous example, there were you, your insurance company, paid $5,000 to Christine. 
But what if you don't have an insurance? What do you do? You're gonna sue him directly, right? So you're gonna sue him. So who are you trying to sue in this case? First of all, let's talk about which court do you want to sue? Civil court. In which court? There were so many courts. San Francisco, Alameda, San Francisco. San Mateo. Oh, which it would be San Mateo because it happened in Skyline. It's in San Mateo. Yeah. Right. San Mateo. Mm -hmm. San Mateo. So you'll be suing in San Mateo County. So Barry, which county do you live in? San Mateo. Uh, let's, assume, let's assume you live. Oh, that's fine. San Mateo. Christine, where do you live? Santa Clara County. Hmm. So Christine lives in Santa Clara County. Of course, it is for your interest to sue in San Mateo County. Oh, I'm sorry, Santa Clara County. For two reasons. One, it's easier for her to go to the court. It's closer to her home. And two, usually a county's judge okay, has a leniency to protect the people, the residents lives in the same county. Okay? So in this case, in this case, Christine decided to sue in Santa Clara County Superior Court. And uh, now we're going to the court system. Which court do you, have, do you want to sue? We have traffic court, criminal court, small claims, re um, regular civil court. We have so many jurisdictions, family court, a local detainer. Which one do you want to, which one do you pick? I would do civil court. You would do civil court. Well, wait, uh, that exceeds 5,000 though, right? Or my, my Damages exceed 5000 so mm -hmm. I'm not sure where it would go. What well, your actual damage, we said, is $3,000, okay? But when you want to sue, do you want to sue for $3,000 or do you want to sue for more? More. More. Because $3,000 is your specific damage movie. You're going to add at least two times general damage. They'll put you at $9,000. So if you want to sue Barry, I'm sorry. If you want to sue Barry for $9,000, which court do you pick in Santa Clara County? Which jurisdiction do you pick? I don't know. You will have to sue every small claim, okay? Because it is less than $10,000, okay? Make sense? Mm -hmm. All right. So, Barry, what is your reaction? You're being sued in Santa Clara County. What's first that comes into your mind? Hire a lawyer. Hire a lawyer. Hey, that's good. Uh, give me a call. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, the other thing is, do you really want your case to be tried at Santa Clara County? Like, I, well, like what I just said, Christine picked Santa Clara County because that's in her advantage. So how do you overcome this advantage? Jackie, what do you think? Um, sorry, what's the question? Question is, what the accident happened here in San Mateo, right? But Christine decided to sue in Santa Clara because that's to her advantage for two reasons. One's closer to her home, and two, judges are more protective to its own residents within the same county. So how do we know that? Um, well, okay. Anybody? Melissa? I don't know. Well, which county do you think is the correct county to file a lawsuit? Yeah, I agree. It should be where the accident occurred, right? Okay, and that will be in San Mateo County. So that, this is where you go to the court and you explain to the court that, Your Honor, we need to change the banning from San Mateo County to San Mateo County. Okay? So that's when you file a motion to the court, a motion to change any. Okay? Let me disappear from the video for a while.
So this is a case. My client is being sued. So what happened is my client is a body shop in Oakland. In the body shop in Oakland. I need lights to my pretty face now. <laughs> I'll try. Okay, so my client is being sued. Okay? So they file a complaint. So if we file a complaint, you always have three things. You have a summon. Okay? What summon, summon does is you tell the, def the defendant that you are being sued by the plaintiff. Okay? So this is my client, Duncan, is being sued by this distributing company. Okay? Right? And the case was filed in San Mateo County in December, on December 2nd. And uh, right here, the San Mateo Superior County, and then that's the attorney for the plaintiff. Okay. So three things in the complaint. You're going to have summons, so you're going to have your complaint, and then you're going to have your civil cover sheet. So this is a civil cover sheet, civil case cover sheet. It will tell the court and the opposing party that what kind of lawsuit this is. Okay, so in this case, that's the contact information, and that's where the court is. Okay, that's the case number, and we're suing in unlimited jurisdiction. So in court, you have a small claims court that governs all the cases that's less than $10,000. And okay. then you have a limited jurisdiction. That here the case that here's the case between ten thousand dollars up to twenty five thousand dollars. Okay, for all the cases that's over twenty five thousand dollars, it becomes an unlimited cases. Okay, so what is this uh, what is this case about? It is right here. Okay, it is a, it is a business unfair. It is under business law unfair business practice. And this is the complaint itself. And this is a form. So you see all these forms are pre-approved by all the courts. Okay? So there's another committee outside of the courts. It's called the Judicial Council. They approve all the courts' decisions. They approve courts' systems. Okay? So these forms are pre-approved by Judicial Council. And what we call those are Judicial Council forms. And usually when I draft my complaint, I use my own type. I, I type out my own, uh, my own uh, complaint. But in this case, uh, the opposing counsel decided to use a form complaint. Okay? Contact info, same thing. Uh, this is contract complaint. Okay? And this is an unlimited case. So we have the complaint, right? It was filed in San Mateo County. So what happened was, in this case, our client has a little body shop in Oakland. He's supposed to buy paint, paint exclusively from this distribution company in San Mateo. But, remember, my argument is, my client purchased the paint and using his paint in Oakland. All the payments are made from his shop in Oakland. And this is for the benefit of his operation in Oakland. So what I did is I challenged, I challenged the venue. Okay, I think San Mateo is not a right court to hear the case. I want this case to be heard in Alameda County. Okay? First of all, why? Why do you think that? True, true, he lives there, and, uh, but in this, time, in this case, it's not that convenient. We are not comparing to having people flying from out of town, right, and just going over the Bay Bridge. 
It's not that bad. But the main reason that we want this court, you know, this case to be heard in Alameda County is because San Mateo County is a very conservative court. Okay? It's very conservative. And uh, it's not as liberal as San Francisco or Alameda, which means they are pro, in one sense, they're pro business owners, they're pro that. Um, the party is being hurt. In this case, that's the distribution company. Okay. Did my client breach the contract? I can't say it, like, or I cannot tell you in front of the camera. Okay, but there's some problems. Okay, there's some problems, and that's why we're being sued. Okay. So, Samatel is not the right court, in my opinion, to hear this case. So, a challenge the motion. I challenge the venue by filing a motion to change venue. Okay. Um, this is filed in January 24th at San Mateo County. Okay. Uh, this is me. You can see my name here. So this, I use our own template, the pleading paper, 28 line paper, okay, pleading paper. So this is for the court of San Mateo, for <coughs> Yeah, okay. Plaintiff versus Duncan. I gotta redact the uh, information. And what is this? <coughs> D O E S one through ten. What does it mean? Anybody? Kevin. Uh, How do you even pronounce it? Does. Huh? Does. Does. Well, before I went to law school, this this is what I thought. Does one through one one through ten, but grammatically it doesn't make any sense. Anybody heard of the phrase uh, John Doe? Yeah. Oh, John Doe. John Doe. Danny, what does John Doe mean? Um, the male that's unidentified? It's an unidentified male. Okay, we don't know his identity. So we said, we we'll give you a name, John Doe. Okay. What about, what about it's a female? Jane. It's gonna be Jane Doe, okay? Right here, so he is suing our client, right? And Doe's in plural, one through 10. So he is reserving his right to sue 10 more unidentified persons, okay? Just in case there are more parties to this case, I'm reserving 10 spots for, the, for these unknown parties. Okay, those one through ten. Inclusive means one and ten are included. And so, how many how many defendants are here for the thing? Technically, they are eleven, 11 defendants, right? Okay. I can show you a case. Is one those one through five hundred? Yes. Could you do that if you didn't know if there were maybe event partners or other people involved in the business? You always do that. You always reserve some spots. Yeah. How, does it, the case depend on, like, uh, is there any way to determine how many does you can go after? Like, could you say uh, 100, or is there like a certain limit? I can show you a case that has 500 does. Does it really depend on the circumstance, how many it is, or? No. no. Can I just say some random, you know, insane number? No, you can that? say it's like 100,000, <laughs> but uh, people <laughs> think you are stupid. How about in their case, mm -hmm. the car crash? Okay, so Christine, when you sue Barry for a car crash, okay, are you going to include those? Always, you always include those. But what other parties do you think? Maybe other cars around him. Maybe other cars around him, okay. Well, in my opinion, I'll think of his parents. Oh, yeah. Right? I'll think about who gave you money to buy the car. 
Okay? I don't know enough facts to include his parents now, but I would say those went through 20 to include, to reserve my right to sue all the other parties, potential parties in this action. Right? Okay? So always have that. So what I did is, in this document, when you do a motion, what, what's a motion? A motion is when you ask the court to do something. You want to move, you want the, you want the court to move, and then you file a motion for the court to move. It's a motion. So when you do motion is you're going to send a notice of motion to the opposing party and the court. Okay, you're going to have some sort of authority to persuade the court to move. All right, and then of course you're going to have a declaration of somebody. Sometimes it comes from the client, and sometimes it comes from the attorney. Yeah. If I go to court and I ask the court for a motion uh -huh. and then the court told me, huh? You know, why do you need to tell the court to only get that money to ask for the motion? I asked the judge. I need a motion for 90 days or 190 days. And they told, well, go back and come to the court. I own the court. I have my own court. Okay. In civil court, if you are asking the court to do something, you are responsible of filing a motion. And in San Francisco, it's sixty dollars whenever you file a new new a new motion. Okay, and if you it is your responsibility, and then usually in civil court they don't take oil. Motions. You're going to be a written motion, and then you're going to have notice, you have to send notice to the other side, so they have a chance to oppose your motion. Okay? So in this case, I send out a, no I send out a notice to the other body, right, under the corresponding code sessions. To show up, there's a hearing. Okay? So this one, notice, there was notice. And then I have memorandum, memorandum of point of authority. This is when you are signing the law. This is when you persuade the judge. And this is when you lay out everything for the other side to attack you. Okay? This is my argument. Okay? So I go over the facts, what happened. And then I have my legal argument. Okay? Believe it or not, I, I draft this. Okay. I said, first, I'm going to come against the proper venue. Okay? Because the contract was entered in the county of Alameda. And the contract was to be performed in Alameda. Right? Because uh, my client has a little shop in Alameda. And I cited to the law. This is the law. So remember I told you about running as time rack. Okay? You're gonna have your issue, you're gonna have your rule, you have an analysis, and you're gonna have, you have your conclusion. So what is my issue here? This is the issue. Whether Alameda is the right place. And what is the rule? The rule is down here. I'm assigning the code. CCP section 395B. Okay? And this is my analysis. Okay? And then citing to this case right here. So now you know the citation is really important. Okay? I'm citing to this uh, the case that was decided in 1967, published here in this book. Okay? I'm also citing more laws, and here, that's where my analysis is. Okay. And to prevail only a motion to change venue, we only need to show it is not a resident in a county where the action was brought. Well, my client is a resident of Alameda County. 
Na, ça m'a fait aucun mec. And this is my conclusion, right? Curry residing in the county of, county of Alameda, right? and therefore proper venue is Alameda County Superior Court. So I have my issue, my rule, my analysis, and my conclusion. So this is why I ask you to do your homework this way, and because all the legal papers are pretty much 99% are done this way, except the opinions engineered by the judge, because they can, they can write whatever they want to write. Oh, by the way, who do you think might be opinion? Majority of the opinions, who wrote them? Do you think the judge wrote the opinion? Yeah. Their clerk does. Okay. All right. And then I have my, see, my third argument, same thing, right? I'm assigning the law, laws, and in this case, it will be a case law instead of an actual statute coming from CCP, California Civil Procedure Code. But in this case, I'm assigning to a case, um, Starway Decisis, right? It's a case law. Okay? Now, analysis and conclusion. I have three arguments. Okay? In each argument, I have my little issue, my little analysis, my little conclusion. And this is my full blown conclusion. So I found my partner. Declaration by my client. Everything said is true. By the president of the proof of service, you always attach a proof, a proof of service. You gotta prove to the court that I sent a copy of whatever documents here again to the opposing counsel. So these are the things, two documents. I'm sending it to Herman Frank, okay, and this date and it's signed by me in this case. Okay? So this is a complete motion to change the value. So they file a complaint, right? Now we're just fighting for the banning. The file complaint is San Mateo County. And I file a motion, I answer and I file a motion to change the venue from San Mateo to Alameda. If you are permanent front, what do you do? Take the light. Okay. Mr. Lee, if you are Mr. Front, what would you do? You file a lawsuit against me in San Mateo, and I go into the court and challenge the venue. Then what do you do? Do you just let it? Do you just sit there and do nothing? Let me win. No, I want to keep the, uh, the, the same. Yeah, you want to keep the case in San Mateo County, right? So you fight with me. So what you do is you file an opposition to my motion to change venue. Okay, so you oppose. My motion. Which you did. Okay. Oh, uh, in the proof of service, you see, you saw a uh, motion to change venue. I also have a proposed order. Okay. So when you go to the court, you always go to the court. If there's a hearing, you always go to the court prepared. So what you do is you carry a proposed order. So if you win the case, hey, here, judge, that's the order for you to sign. Okay? So they don't, they don't stop the process. They can sign the order right away. I can show you a sample later. But in this case, Mr. Bunt. What is this? There's an opposition to the motion to change venue. Okay. Of course, he is listing all these region, reasons to reiterate that this case needs to be heard in San Mateo County. Okay. 
but you can see it's it's getting down uh, narrower and smaller. Uh, uh, the length of the, the, the motion or the opposition has become shorter and shorter. Okay, because the things that we can argue becomes less and less. We just get down to one, maybe two, maybe three points instead of uh, initially I have ten points or he has, he has ten points. Well, that's the exhibit. Uh, just part of the complaint, cause of action. So cause of action, does anybody understand cause of action? In a complaint, you are supposed to list the reason that you sue, not just the reasons, a legal theory that you have to sue. That's what I call the cause of action. Okay? So when uh, Christine suing Barry, you'll be suing for it personal injury and property damage. Okay, so you have two causes of actions. And on top of that, basically it's gonna be a motor vehicle damage, one. And two, you'll be asking for a negligent lawsuit. Okay, because you cannot prove that he hit you intentionally. Because otherwise it will be a different lawsuit. Okay, not the cause of action. If you bury you hit her person uh, you, uh, with the intent, and that becomes a battery. That's another cause of action. A regular, a regular car accident, you sue for two things, motor vehicles and um, negligence. Okay? So Mr. Frank filed a opposition to my motion to change planning. What do you think I do? I'm opposing his opposition. So I have a reply to the opposition of motion to change venue. That's called on tape, by the way. <laughs> Hello, that's my name again. And uh, this time, still as a motel. Defendants, my clients, reply to plaintiff's opposition to a motion to change venue again. So it's my reply to the opposition of my motion to change venue. Okay. Then again, it gets shorter and shorter. To change venue, change venue. I filed a proposed order. Uh, proposed order at the same time I filed the motion. to the proposed order to the first page. But this is an actual order granting my motion. So on the day time, right, so we exchange all the paperwork. On the day time of the hearing, I went to the court, okay, and the opposing counsel, Mr. Frank, uh, attended the hearing by telephone call. Okay? Uh, there's a program called Court Call that you pay about eighty dollars every time you make a phone conference. Okay, there's something wrong with the internet. <laughs> okay, but anyways, so I went to the court. This is some material coming in, and we argued in front of the judge, and I won. And that's why I showed you this example because I won. Uh, <laughs> hey, come on. Okay. So we will say, uh, we will bring a proposed order to the court, we will file it, okay? You will be saying in brackets, proposed brackets, order of, you know, 
granting this, and then we have the language and then a place for judge to sign. Okay, that's proposed order. And if if I want, uh, in, in this case, I want, I did want, I did want. So um, uh, the clerk is going to give a copy of the proposed order to the judge. So the judge will do is he will scratch out, okay, use the pen, scratch out the word proposed. And this becomes an actual order, so he will sign it. I give up on this one. Okay? So that's how you find a venue. Okay? The case needs to be filed in the proper venue. I cannot go down, in this case, Christine's case, suing Barry. You don't want to go down to Santa Clara. You don't want to go down to LA. You don't want to go to San Diego to file a lawsuit <laughs> against Barry. Okay? Well, I uh, see obvious reasons, right? If you file a lawsuit against Barry in San Diego, if you're there for, if you live there for, for a year, uh, it, it's very unlikely for Barry to fly down there to attend maybe one, maybe two trials. Okay, it's burdensome for him. So the court, the law says, the proper venue usually is where the accident occurs. In this case, in your case, it will be San Mateo. Or where the defendant resides. Not the plaintiff, but the defendant resides. Okay. Your case, Senator. Yes. So, if uh, a defendant was very wealthy and owned houses, you know, in say Michigan or New York, mm -hmm. they could make the venue there in order to make it hard for the plaintiff to get a good uh -huh. case against them. Now, when we talk about venues, we're talking about within the same state. Well, let's, let's assume it's uh, also in San Diego. Let's, let's assume this is not in the same state. Let's assume it's, it's from different state. Okay? Uh, what's your name? Chantel. Chantel, okay. Chantel is from Texas, a cowgirl, very wealthy. Okay? So what she does is she flies to San Francisco okay, for a vacation. Okay? And she flies over, and again, driving a very small car, I don't know why, but we really in it by Mr. Barry here. Okay. And then, only because you were here for a weekend, Chantel fl uh, flies back to Texas and decided to file a lawsuit in Texas against Barry. Would that work? It's not going to work, okay? Because now we're talking about, that's the second issue I'm going to go into, the jurisdictions, okay? Each state are separate. Each state are separate. Their legal system are also separate. So in this case, in your case, I can't stand the light. jurisdiction over this matter. No. What do you think? No. no? No? Anybody says yes? Okay. Who is that venue? Well, in, in the previous case, Santa Clara County has an interest to protect its own residents. It's even more so in the state, in state level. The courts in Texas has a much greater interest to protect its own citizens against citizens from California. Okay, it's even so, more so. So, and that barrier, of course, is gonna challenge the jurisdiction. The accident occurs in San Francisco, California. Why? Why is this is going to be heard in Texas? Have you ever been in Texas before? Uh, I've been in the airport. It's only been an airport, very briefly. Why is it being sued in Texas? It doesn't make any sense. Okay, let's change the fact a little bit. Okay. I mean, pick someone I haven't been picked for a while. Doc. All right. All right. Doc's bikini shop, headquarters in Fishman's Wall. Oh, very good, even better. How's that? 
you owns a bikini shop that sells bikinis through internet to all for the for all fifty states, for the United States except Alaska, too cold. Okay, <laughs> too cold. So, but your headquarters is here in San Francisco. Okay. Now, Chantel purchased a several pairs of bikini from you, and they're just defective. Okay, they're just uh, not well made and embarrassed her publicly, eventually. Okay, so she decided to sue you, but in this case, she wanted to sue you in Texas. Can she do that? She can try. Yes, she can try. Yes. Any other guess? Can she? Yeah. Can she? Can yeah. she question yes? Well, why do you say yes? Well, she's a resident of Texas. She's a resident of Texas. She pays taxes. Uh-huh. And that's about it. But she can try. Well, no. What about the previous case when Chanchi was suing Barry? She resides in Texas. She pays taxes in Texas, in Texas, and she cannot sue Barry in Texas because the accident happened here. And Barry never been to Texas before. Well, this is, yeah, like she bought it through the internet though, right? She yeah. bought it through the internet, yeah. okay. It's because he does business in Texas, which kind of yes, opens that's up correct. some losses. That's correct, that's because Doc conduct business continuously and systematically throughout all the four or four United States. Okay? And therefore you can bring a lawsuit against Doc in Texas. Alright? And what about Kevin, who lives in Alaska, bought a several pair of bikinis and for whatever reason tried to sue Doc. Do you think that will work? Yeah, I mean you could try. No. No. I would just say, I just said you only sell bikinis to forty nine states except Alaska. And Kevin purchased your bikinis what somewhere he, else, not in Alaska. Travel, say he was in New York. Okay, he was in New York. And he purchased it. He purchased while it. he was in New York. Okay, so Kevin traveled and his to New York. resident is in Alaska. Yes, he could he could try to see. Okay. So 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 the hypothetical is Kevin traveled to New York and purchased your bikinis for whatever use and then bring them back to Alaska. And again, public, uh, public, publicly embarrassed himself and now he decided to sue you in Alaska. Well, the answer is no, he cannot sue you in Alaska because you don't have the connection to Alaska. Therefore, Alaska has no jurisdiction over you. Okay? That's what we call the minimum contact. There's no minimum contact between you and Alaska. But can you sue in New York? Yeah, the answer is yes. Okay? Can he purchase in New York? He can sue in New York's court. Or pretty much any old 49 states except Alaska. What did you call it? Minimum what? Contact. Minimum contact. There's a six-part test to it. I'm not going to bore you with that, but uh, you need to have a minimum contact. Is that a test question? No. Okay. Yes? So I used to work for a company who only sold within the U.S. and Canada. Okay. But if we had international customers, we would refer them to a third party that they can use to ship items internationally. Mm -hmm. Let's say an international client wants to sue who, how would that? Well, they can sue you in two courts. One, and multiple courts. Why don't they sue, sue you in international court? And two, they can sue you in federal court. And thirdly, they can sue you in where the company was headquartered. Okay. Any questions? Let's take a uh, 10 minute break. Love letters. Okay, we're back. So, like I said, Doc, company selling business 
over or for the United States. But what about, what about, there are two exceptions to this, jurisdictions. Okay, remember, minimal contact requires six part test. Okay, we're not going to go into detail, but there are two exceptions. One is called personal, it's what I mean, personal, which is, uh, means you personally appear in this jurisdiction, then you're subject to be sued in this jurisdiction. Okay? All right, so let's change the fact. Chantel from Texas, wealthy family traveled to San Francisco, jumped in the car. In this case, she, okay, collide her vehicle into Barry's car. So in this case, Barry is a victim. You are the beggar, okay? Now, can Barry file a lawsuit against Chantel in San Francisco? Of course, you know, after, after the accident, you flew back to Texas. Now, can Mary file a lawsuit in San Francisco despite the fact that she is back now back to Texas? I think yes. Because yeah, the answer is yes, because she personally appeared here in California, in San Francisco, and you can sue her, even though it's different um, states and different jurisdictions. Okay. Now, Yeah. I was looking at you. You know, get into you. <laughs> and Nicole. All right. So let's do it this way. Um, Nicole is from uh, California. All right. And uh, say, where are you from? Um, let's say New York. New York. New York. Okay. okay. And then Melissa. Nevada, she's from uh, Las Vegas. So, all three of you boarded in onto the same airplane, going from SFO to New York. Okay, good. All right. By the time the airplane going left California airspace, going into Nevada airspace, okay, these three girls get into a cat fight. Barry is sitting right there and saying, yeah, great, good show. <laughs> okay, you got into a fight. Okay. And when it turned out, Melissa, uh, because, you know, uh, uh, saying, and, and, and Nicole had too much to drink. Apparently, I don't know which airline, they gave out too much free alcohol. So they got drunk, they jumped, Melissa. All right. Now, Melissa is going to sue in the father. Can she do that? Of course you want to, right? It's your home turf. But can she? Yes. So what is the issue here? Okay, so she's going to sue from where? Nevada. Oh, Nevada. All right. Where was the plane flying over? Was it still over Nevada? When the fight occurred, when she got jumped, it, it is in Nevada's air space. Oh, then she can sue in Nevada. Yes, that you can sue in Nevada because you guys personally appeared in Nevada in this airspace. Okay. What if it happen in like some other some other state? Some other state you probably cannot sue yeah. from Nevada. Okay, so Barry brought me a real case. Okay. So your grandpa has a a real a piece of real property in Florida, and when your grandpa passed away, I'm so sorry. Um, when the grandpa passed away, the mortgage company, reverse mortgage company, eventually, years after he passed, found Barry and sued you and your family. How much you are the inheritance? He sold it. They're split between these four or five people. Okay, four or five people. They're all in California. Mm. Okay? So, assuming Barry never set the food in Florida, there's no personal appearance, right? Even if you did, it has nothing to do with this piece of pro real property. Now, can they sue you from Florida? Can they sue Barry? Do they have the jurisdiction to sue him? The answer is yes, because he is tied to this piece of real property. So there are two ways you can be sued in this jurisdiction. Personally appear, you're personally there, or two, you have a real property, and they're tied to you. 
Any questions? So if you bought the land, I don't know the people, Jessica, if you, had, you bought the land in, 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 in let's say, uh, Massachusetts, okay? You bought the land there, you've never been there before, you contact that agent to buy the land over there. And if somebody trip and fall into a, uh, a hole in your land, they can sue you. Even though you've never been there before, but because of this real property, it will tie you into this jurisdiction problem. Okay. If you have a sign that says danger, no holes, would that what, protect you from liability? Mm -hmm. If you had like a little sign that said danger, no. Mm -hmm. Have you ever heard holes. about a term called an attractive nuisance? Attractive what? Attractive nuisance. Okay. So uh, we're going now. We're going to towards. Okay. So do you know nuisance means? Uh, irritating. Irritating. You're causing problems to the others. Okay. Now, if I have a uh, let's say I have a swimming pool. I have a fancy swimming pool. No, I don't want to use my hand. Jackie has a swimming pool. Fancy swimming pool. Okay? Olympic size in her backyard. Okay? 50 foot long. Okay? Now, when you're not home, what do you do to a swimming pool? Cover it. You cover it up. Okay? What if a kid, seven year old, likes to touch a pool? Okay? He climb over the fence and dive into the pool and drown. Can the parents sue you for the death of the child? The answer is yes, because the swimming pool itself attracts children. Okay? You have a duty to take precaution. Now, do you need to build the fence to be like 30 feet tall? Probably not. The summary in between is how you protect. Okay, the children, not for really yourself. You gotta protect the children from coming coming onto your property to not to die. Here's the people. Listen. Um, can you give me an example? Your question. Um, so there is like a little area underneath the Golden Gate Bridge where mm -hmm. it's fenced off, but someone can easily go around and go in it. Mm -hmm. um, so let's say somebody went in there, pretty much trespassing, mm -hmm. um, and gets caught in the waves because mm -hmm. they were too close to the edge mm -hmm. and dies. And, <laughs> and then the family sues the city for not properly, I don't know, barricading the area. Okay. Uh, the check of nuisance applies to children. It doesn't um, apply to adults. So it's not the right cause of action. And, uh, well, if I'm still this attorney, I'll pay the case. I'll settle the case right away. I'll pay to shut them up before the case goes to press. Either way, it's going to damage the city's uh, image. Oh, what was that? Okay. So, uh, yeah. Back to the pool part, can't you just uh, counter sue for trespassing? A kid died. You want to sue a dead person? Well, the family. If their the family's suing them. Well, who trespassed? The boy. The boy died. No, I, I know that, but I mean, they wouldn't count. Uh, they wouldn't sue in general if nothing happened to him. If something happened to him, and the parents sued. Let, him. Let's face it in real life. Okay. You, 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 Jackie. You own the swimming pool, and my kid. Not me, Barry. Barry's kid. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You're sitting right here. I'm sorry, man. So, fictitious, uh, this is David sitting right here. So, David's kid, David Jr., climbed over and died drunk. Okay? And they're going to sue you for, 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 for uh, premises liability. They're going to sue you for all other uh, drugs and nuisance. And you file a lawsuit against the parents for what? For not supervising negligence? How you could, how 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 is jury gonna look at you? How is the judge gonna look at you and and award you in not even a cent? But then what they wanted to do is they were going to find you a million dollar not beyond one point five. Okay, because you were just a bad person by doing a cross complaint. 
Okay? Yeah, that's real life. Good? Yeah. So even like a sign that says danger pool, stay out, wouldn't be enough to protect you. You need like a barbed wire fence or something. You have to make sure the kids understand the danger. So a sign wouldn't be enough, even if they can understand it? Well, you have a huge sign. You, you put out a few stop signs from the street, but your fence is one foot tall. What does it do? It doesn't, doesn't do anything. Okay? If your fence is 12 feet, 15 feet tall, and the kids still manage to come over, and then your liability will decrease substantially. Because okay? you, you did your best to prevent this from happening. You'd still probably uh, lose anyway, though. You probably wouldn't have to pay as much, though. How about if they cover the bull? You know, the bull come over, uh -huh. and he's coming along. I mean, if you did your best, there's no other way for you to prevent this joining from happening, then you're probably going to be safe. Okay? So uh, what I did is I put in uh, 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 wire fence. Wire fence. I put in uh, like bars. Guard dogs. Okay. All right. <laughs> and then and the kid shut my guard dogs. Okay. <laughs> open my bars and then jumped in there and died. I'm probably okay. Uh, I'll probably be safe. Right. Right. There's no bright line saying what well, you did this. You say no. There's no such. A line for you to jump. Then that's why lawyers make money. Any questions? So we cover the jurisdictions. We cover Daniel. Okay. Okay. Let's think about this. Huh? I like Kevin's example. Kevin purchased some uh, bikinis and embarrassed himself in the public. And Jackie, as Kevin's close friend, Jackie says, I cannot stand this. Kevin, I know you don't want to sue to look bad. I will sue you on your behalf. Okay? I will sue Doc right there, who sold to this piece of bikinis <laughs> that embarrassed you in the public. All right? I'm going to sue on your behalf. And then Jackie did find a lawsuit in San Francisco against Doc. Can she do that? Yeah. yeah. You would say, yeah, why? Um, I think someone, especially if they're in a jurisdiction, can represent you in that case. I'm not quite sure on the details. So. Okay, you're not quite sure. Christine? Uh, unless it's a child who can't sue on someone's behalf. Yeah, you cannot oh. sue on someone else's behalf. You don't have the standing. Okay. You don't have to scan it. You're going to sue yourself. Or if Kevin is a minor, his parents can sue. If Kevin is legally incompetent, and then your guardian can sue on your behalf. Okay? Sorry, Jackie. I know you hate that piece of beginning up. Kevin I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Can't use the bikini. Uh, the, 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 It'd be really funny if he did get a real case involving bikinis. <laughs> what kind of bikinis are involved in bikinis? I don't know. I don't want to know. <laughs> okay, so let's go back to a um, personal injury case. Like I said, after finishing the treatment, we'll send out a demand package. I'll show you what a real demand package looks like. In this case, my client was riding a bike. Okay? It was a side truck from side truck from the left by a truck. Okay? So she suffered
So what happened to my client was he got hit from the side, from the left, okay, and then he fell down. There's a broken wrist, okay? uh, and then she has to go see. She had a bipolar before, and uh, that was a like 10 to 12 years ago. And this event triggered his mental problems again. Okay? So I sent it out as a fax and email. I sent it to the insurance adjuster from my system to that phone number, claim number, client, that's the date, and it's a 359 pages. I sent it out via fax and email, send it to Gallagher Bassin, which is the insurance company for GIG. So we will present the client, and how much am I asking? We're asking for a half of a million dollars because of the injury. Okay. So approximately 9.50 a.m. was riding a bike and was hit by the defendant in this case. We haven't had a lawsuit yet, so it's by the liability bike. And the traffic report, the police report says it was concluded that their insured, the truck driver, was liable. And this is, this is the injury here that our client suffers. This is the actual injury that we listed. And these are the medications my clients are taking. And this is the result for PTSD. It's mental, or mental issues, mental problems. And these are the medical bills and other related expenses. Now after reading this, are you gonna cry? Right? And therefore we're asking for five hundred thousand dollars. If you add up the numbers, that goes about around a hundred thousand. We're asking five more, five, five, five times for general damage. We need four hundred thousand dollars of general damage. Will I get it? Probably not. Okay. So, but that's a do not copy my signature. Do not take photos. Uh, but this is a good starting point. We we'll start with five times of the damage. Usually start about five times, and then it goes out. I'm lucky you get twice, maybe three times. Does it generally need to be physical damage in order for you to go about the mental anguish with it? Because I remember one time I got lightly tapped by a car and it moved my bike a few feet. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't sort of really get anything from that, or would it not be worth your time? Like, you know, you could say, you know, it was a horrifying experience. And oh, no, she caused to see three, um, like one psychiatrist and two uh, psychologists. And there's a heavy medication that she has to take. Now everything that she suffers was legit. Okay, we have heavy documentation. And that's why you see more than 300 pages of documentation relating to her injury. Okay. Now, so they got it. And insurance companies stopped talking to us. And they hired a law firm. I was talking to their law firm right now. To their lawyers. Okay. What if? What if they don't pay? What if they say, well, our truck driver is not liable? They will have no choice but to file a lawsuit. Okay? In this case, we're going to file at a Christine's case. We sue Barry, it's going to be in a small claims. Liability, and this case is too small to bring to the Singapore. 
So I decided to file in the small claims lawsuit. I'll file in the lawsuit tomorrow. And then you see the forms are very different for small claims because they're decided for layperson, not for the attorney. I'm suing in San Mateo County because they are cursed right outside of the bar station. So that's me, that's one of the plaintiffs, that's my wife. Okay. We're suing the defendant. Okay. And why? Because the defendant really ended my car while well, my wife was a, was a passenger. I'm asking for $9,736. That's quite to the cap to the small claims limit. How do I come up with that number? Okay. Uh, right here, medical bills for both plaintiffs are 28. General damage multiplied that by two, and repair estimate it comes to $1,000. So they get it up as $9,000. One requirement for small claims you have to ask the defendant in writing or by the phone to pay you before you sue. Have you done this? Yes. Why? I didn't talk to her personally, but I talked to her insurance company. So they knew. Okay? And that's it. That's how simple it is. You don't have summons, you don't have civil cover sheet. And this is what I got. When you find a small claim, it's very simple. Now let me show you a personal injury in the regular, a complaint in the regular, in the regular um, civil court, okay? Now again, we start with summons. Remember when we have summons, civil case cover sheet, and we'll have complaint, okay? So, who are we suing? I'm suing a cab company, okay? I'm suing a cab company. That's the driver, that's the cab company, and those are the money. I'm reserving my right to sue. Okay, this is filed in San Francisco, 400 McCallum Street, San Francisco. Civil cover sheet, I'm suing under on, on, on tort, tort. Okay, it's a car accident. And this is not a complex, complex case. When you have parties, more than 10 parties, the case becomes a complex case. This is much more complicated. Usually a different judge will be assigned to handle this case. Okay? Uh, we're looking for monetary damage. And sometimes you can ask for non-monetary damage for, or injunctive relief. Or sometimes you can ask for a punitive damage. Okay? So we ask for a injunctive relief. For example, Christine has a newspaper and she kept saying bad things about me on her newspaper. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get a injunctive relief for her to stop doing it. So if I win the case, the court is going to tell Christine, you cannot do this anymore. I'm also asking for Punitive damage. I'm going to punish you for a bad month in me for the past two and a half hours. Okay? And this is not a class action. And then we go into the real needs. Oh, ah. This is the second page of civil cover sheet. 
one time I filed my complaint with Alameda County and I didn't attach the second sheet. And there's nothing for you to write here. Nothing, absolutely nothing for you to write. So I take this page out because we do fax filing, we charge by page. So they can save a dollar by taking this page out. I fax it in while it was rejected because it's missing this page. Okay. So this is a complaint. This is a form complaint. Okay. I'm suing for personal injuries, property damage, and wrongful death. Well, and then I'm suing under unlimited jurisdiction. And you know, I'm asking for more than twenty-five thousand dollars. Okay. All right. I'm suing for personal injury. I'm suing for motor vehicle, I'm suing for general negligence. I'm asking for wage claim, wage loss, loss of use of property, for medical expenses, general damage, and property damage. Property damage. <clears throat> and how much exactly am I asking? Well, this is a, a, a strategic move. You're going to put in a number here, or you can just put it here according to proof. In this case, we want to save this number until later. Okay? And in our demand letter, we are asking for one hundred and fifty thousand. Okay. First cause of action: vehicle tour. Okay. So, Bandit was walking across the street and near the intersection of the Maple Street, San Francisco. Defendant was operating a taxi cab under defendant cab company, struck my, my, uh, struck my client while she was in the middle of the street. And the direct force of the collision caused her to slam on the vehicle and then the ground. Anybody can tell what exactly happened here? Who's at fault? While I said here, yeah, everything, I wrote every single word. Every word here serves a purpose. Okay. So what happened to my client? Can you picture what happened? So you're nodding. You're saying? She had hit by a car. Huh? She had hit by a car. She had hit by a car. <coughs> she had hit by a car in? In the middle of the street. OK. So that's her fault. It's her fault because? Was she on the crosswalk? I on the? Did I say she was on the crosswalk? No, she was just near the intersection. She was near the intersection. So, so she's she was jaywalking. Okay. So this is a very fancy way of saying she's jaywalking. Okay. I said she was crossing the street near the intersection, and uh, the cab driver admitted to the cop that he was looking for customers on the sidewalk, and he was not paying attention to the front. And that's why he didn't see my client, OK? <laughs> Second cause of action is negligent. So this is a little bit more than the one we had before. The key word here is negligent. So negligently operating the taxi drive, negligently struck my client. Okay. So I have two cause of actions. One, motor uh, vehicle tort, and two, negligence. Okay. So after the lawsuit is filed. The court will give you a notice for case management conference. So case management conference usually is a couple months out after you file a complaint. 
So the purpose of CMC is that the judge wants to know what the hell is going on within the past few months. What have you done? Where are we in this case? Okay? So that's what CMC is for. So 15 days prior to CMC, you had to file a case management statement with the board. You have to let the court know what happened during the past few months. Okay? In this case, we have this case in Mendocino County. There's no way for me to drive up there to file this and come back. And my client is not going to pay my time for this. So what I did is we send in an original copy, original and two copies of the document. Okay? Why do you think I need this much copies? This many copies? In case one gets lost in transition. Ah, good point. No. Signature? The original will be retained by the court. But I need a copy. Right? I need a copy. And usually I save an additional copy just in case you write that or I'll send it to the client. And what about the other party? What about opposing counsel? I'll send one to the opposing counsel, opposing counsel at the same time I send it to the court. And that does need to be endorsed by the court. So this is the thing I send it to the opposing counsel in the court. So, so when I get back from the court, the court will, will put a big stand right here when this was filed. Okay. Case number, defendant, defendant. What kind of case? When is the hearing? Okay. So what happened in this case? Right here. Defendants leased a house. Okay? They leave the house in my client's house. Okay? But this house is management. It's managed by a different party, by a management company. Okay? So it's rented from my my client and it's it is it was managed by the co-defendant. Okay? But this company. And uh, about 40 days they moved out. And a year later they filed a lawsuit for personal injury. They're saying the house is bad. We all got sick in this 40 days. Okay? And they requested now we request a non-jury trial. Okay? We would it is a a, a a lawsuit involved with landlord and tenants. As landlord attorney, most of the time we don't want a jury trial. We want a non-jury trial. Or what I call the bench trial. It'll be heard by the bench. You know what bench means, right? Yes. Okay? Bench is where the judge sits. That's the bench. Okay? It's like podium, but that's a bench. Okay? When the court and the judge says counsel approach to the bench, then that's when we'll go to the bench and talk to the judge off the record. Okay? No trial date has been set. If it goes to trial, how many days do we expect? Five to seven days. So you have to tell the court what has been done in the past few months. And ADR, alternative dispute resolution. What have you done? What will be? What will you done? And what is your plan on that? And we plan to go to mediation. And in fact, it was completed on this date. Okay? And we agreed to go to a settlement conference, which was not yet scheduled. So you tell the court what you want. And we're planning to do this. 
Blended, co-dependent, we're going to do written discoveries, which is sent, but we're, we're planning on doing depositions in October. Now, in this case, who likes to be my client? I'll volunteer you with it. Okay, so Melissa is my client, so she is the owner of this house. Okay, in this case. So, let's see here, Barry. Sure, why not? Uh, Barry is the management company. Okay, you bought the house. You manage the house. Okay. Karen is the people who lease the house. He moved into the house, and unfortunately, I checked the data. You moved into the house, and within that 30 days after you moved in, that's in the hist historical high that, that has the most humid and rainy season of the past 75 years. So the water everywhere, moist, mold everywhere, and that's why I decided to move out after 40 days. I decided to file a lawsuit against there's two parties. You file a lawsuit against management company, you file a lawsuit against the owner. Okay? Alright. So I will present the owner. Okay. So now you being sued, what is your first reaction? You 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 you, you bought the house, you never set a foot in the house. Uh, well, you haven't been to the house for a couple of years. You let your company or your management company to repair, to maintain, to lease out the house. So what is your first reaction? Barry, why did you take care of it? Barry, why, did you, why didn't you take care of the house, right? It's quite natural, right? So what do we do, Melissa? We file a cross complaint against Barry, okay? In case we lost the case against Kevin, Barry, you are liable to pay my loss. So we file a lawsuit against you. So this is a complaint filed by Kevin, the tenant. He filed against Barry and Melissa as a property manager and the owner. Okay, so in this case, now you see my name again. 
We are suing the first complaint against implied contractual indemnity and equitable indemnity. All right. So we'll file a lawsuit, okay? Cause of action, just like you saw before. Okay. Okay. Well, Barry was very nice. Barry thinks, I'm just going to hire a lawyer. Hopefully, there's enough facts to prove that I'm innocent. And Barry's lawyer, Mr. Ginelli, thinks otherwise. He thinks, you point finger at us, we're going to point fingers at you, Melissa. So they fired the cross complaint against us. All right? And they basically copy and paste our complaint. Same thing, imply a community and contribution to the culture of relief. Now, now, this is what I call the caption page. A caption page will have a contact info for the lawyers. Okay? This is attorney for which party. And this is the court. Okay? And this is the case number. In this case, we will have um, complaint by the date. Oh, this information is not necessary. And this is the cause of action. The name of this paper, this document, and if it's a complaint, you're going to list the cause of actions. Plaintiff, defendant, those, one through 500. So they're reserving 500 spaces to sue more people. I don't know. I don't know why. I think they probably just uh, hit the zero one more time <laughs> by mistake. Yes. Is that the highest you've ever seen? Or no, no. I've seen two thousand. Okay. And now this is where Melissa. We are the cross complaint complainant suing Barry, and this is where Barry sues us back. Okay. Are you suing back when you do something like that? Is that still part of the caption page? Yeah, those are still part of the caption page. Yes. So a cross complaint is where a defendant is suing each other for responsibility for what happened. You can sue Kevin back if you think he is harassing you. Oh, so that would also be a cross. Yeah, you can also be a cross. In California, whatever which way it goes, it's always called cross complaint. In federal, it's called a different. It's called counter. Okay. So after everybody is happy with their complaint, Kevin filed two complaints. All right. We filed a cross complaint against Barry Verified, a cross complaint against us. Now, what do we do? Everyone's happy with their complaint. Now it's time for us to find the answer. So you file a complaint, you have to serve your defendant the summary and the complaint. So you're gonna tell them that you're being sued. Okay? Kevin you cannot sue us and never serve us a paper. So we never knew we were being sued. And then 60 days later you go to the court and say, hey, we won the case. They never showed up, I won. It doesn't work that way. We have a constitutional right to know that we're being sued. Okay, so that's why you have to serve us the paper. So once we serve the paper, we realize the situation. We know we're being sued. We'll file a constant complaint against Barry, and then now we're filing an answer to Kevin's complaint. I'll have to already answer, but this is the answer that we prepared. I believe it was prepared by, by Barry. Yes. This is answer, answer prepared by Barry answering our complaint. Okay. So this is answer for all of Barry to our cross complaint. You always do this. The answer first thing you do is general denial. 
Nothing happened. I'm in right. Nothing happened. I denied everything. There's a blanket general denial. And then you go to go into affirmative defense. Affirmative defense. You're going to list every single one of them. If you don't list your affirmative defense here, you lose your right to bring it up later. Okay? So that's important. Affirm affirmative defense. So that's the answer. Okay? Not too much facts has been involved. Kevin D'Souza, some facts. Wu Barry, some facts. Gary Souza, denial. I didn't do it. <coughs> Affirmative defense, not my fault. Okay? So, so far. Answer. Okay? Now, after the answer, that's where we go into the discovery phase. Okay? Now, that's. Okay. Now, generally, when people file a complaint against you, you have a chance to file a complaint right away. So, let's say here, Doc. Doc. Right. Doc drove his very nice car. Give me a fictitious car that you drive. So it's just BMW. BMW. 540. 540. Ooh. Okay. All right. Um, Doc was driving his uh, BMW 540. Okay. And then he crashed into a parked car, parked car in front of the red light. Okay. Melina. Okay. What kind of car do you drive? What kind of car did you drive? Hmm? Okay, so Melinda parked her car at the, in front of a red light. Okay, and then Doug, of course, driving a BMW 540, never stopped for a red light, crashed into Melinda traffic light. Okay, all right, and Melinda then filed a lawsuit against Doc. But Melinda never knew the identity of Doc. Okay, because Doc and I, we look alike. So Melinda filed also against me, saying I was the driver that hit her, that crashed, that collided into her vehicle. All right, so at the time I received, at the time I received, the complaint, I have a chance to buy a demur. Okay? I have a chance to buy a demur. I can demur your complaint. Basically just saying, well, there's a fundamental problem with your complaint. That's why the court, the court should dismiss the complaint and dismiss the entire action. Okay? Well, usually the demur are based on the question of law. So it means, it means you use the wrong law, or the law does not apply to the current case. That's when you find a demur. Now, so that's the first thing you can attack, a complaint attack a lawsuit. Now after, we'll find, we'll find the answers, and, and, and then you have another chance to attack the complaint. That's when you file a motion for a summary judgment. And this happens after you find out the answer. And motion for summary judgment is usually based on facts. It's not based on law. Because you already had a chance to challenge the case based on law. That's your demur. And you can demur the case. And then you realize the facts doesn't support it. There's not enough facts. Or well, the facts itself is sufficient to decide the case. We don't need to go forward. Then you can do a motion for summary judgment. So Nicole owes Barry some money. Nicole goes, oh, I, okay, uh, she, she, she's looking sad, I'm sorry. Barry, you owe Nicole $500,000, okay? All right, and you refuse to pay her back. But at the time that you guys are arguing, 
there is a written agreement. There's a promissory note that you borrowed five hundred thousand dollars, right? And then after she was fighting with you, and then you write a declaration once again, prove that you owe her five hundred thousand dollars. Now, when she sues you, when she sues you, okay, and then when they go into the motion motion for summary judgment phase. Now, both parties can file a motion for summary judgment. And then she can just tell the court, saying, well, there's no dispute over the fence. He owes me money, and he owes me this much. This is the promissory note, and this is the declaration he approved. He approved. He declared that he owes me this much money. We don't need to go further. Just give me the judgment. So that's that's when you do a motion for summary judgment. And the other time, the other time when you do a motion for summary judgment is, Mr. Lee, you are from Korea? Yes, okay. So, um, so you sue someone in Korea, okay? And, uh, well, that person has no money in Korea, but he has some houses here in California, okay? So what you do is you sue them in Korea and you won your lawsuit. And you take the judgment over here. Okay, I'm not sure if there's a treaty between Korea and China. I no idea. Uh, and, and even the United States, I have no idea. Assuming there's no treaty for the court in the United States to recognize the judgment from Korea, what they need to do is you file a new lawsuit here in California. Okay. After you file a lawsuit, you bring the judgment from Korea and present it to the judge and ask for a motion for summary judgment. Okay, so you don't have to go through the entire trial process. Okay. Uh, any questions about that? Five minutes. Let's take a break. You need to check the two now. I make more than forty thousand dollars. No, I don't. Do you think you make the right decision? Yes, I do. Yeah. I have the, because we have four lawyers in the firm, and uh, but, uh, so two of us have the best customer control, the client control. So you have to be able to control your client when you're going to mediation, when you're going to arbitration. Right. right. You have, they, have, they have to be able to listen to you, because otherwise it would be very difficult to move the case forward. Yeah. Okay. So where are we? So we have, oh, motions. Okay. So we're done with a motion for summary judgment. Now, complaint done, answers finished, motions. And there are a lot of motions that we do. Okay. There are countless type of motions. As long as you want the court to do something, you do a motion. And then after you file the answer, that's when we start the discoveries. Okay? Discoveries. Discoveries is how you <coughs> obtain evidence. So very I want to know what happened in this case. I will send you interrogatories. There are four interrogatories prepared by the court, by the judicial counsel form. So ask for background information, basic information. I sent you a special interrogatories. If I, I will ask you to answer all the questions that, that, that I have. And all the answers that you have, you provided to me, can be used in the court as evidence. And if I need some documentation, I will send out a request for productions for documents, and then you'll comply with that. And if I want you to say, did you hit Melissa on that day? Then I'll send you a request for admission. Either you admit or you deny, okay? So these are the steps. You have certain set to you, certain set to me. I can send you a second set, third set, fourth set, if necessary, okay? So what, what if I ask you the question, did you hit Melissa last year, September 11th? And then Barry said, objection, right? So you can object to my question. You can object to my request, okay? And then the objection is for intrusion of the privacy. And I sort of scratch my head. How is this question invade your privacy, right? You hit her or not, 
Okay? So what do I do? I'll send a letter to Barry. I don't think your objection stands. This is what I call a mean and confirm. I don't, I don't think your ob objection stands. So please provide me with the answer. Okay? And if you don't, I'm going to file a motion to compel and ask the court to give you the sanction. You. Okay? So if you still don't give me the answers, then I go to the court and I file a motion to compel. Uh, force the court, I'll uh, ask the court to force you to answer my question. Okay? At the same time, I'm asking the court to ask you to pay for my fees, right, all the time I have spent to draft this motion, and then punish you with the sanction. Do you know what sanction means, right? Okay, sanction means the court is going to find you. Okay? The court thinks you are to find you. Sanction. S A N C T R O D. Sanction. So the court thinks you are doing something wrong. The court is going to punish you. Okay? Sanction. So, so as lawyers, the court has two ways to punish you. One, they can hold you in contempt up to 48 hours. You can be seated in jail and they can so they can sanction you. Okay? It's either monetary or put you in jail. Yeah. Isn't that the same thing when someone tries to lie to get a jury duty? Uh, you hold the court in contempt? Oh, yeah. They hold, yeah. I mean, hold different circumstance, but same uh, breach of. Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a different circumstance, but it's the same breach of uh, procedure or how you're supposed to be in the court. Yeah. Okay. Discovery is a motion to compel, and that's the time that people start to see if we can settle the case before it goes to trial. Okay? And that's when we go into mediation or arbitration. The difference between mediation and arbitration is arbitration is binding. They have an arbitrator that acts just like a judge, and then his decision is binding. Okay? But usually, why do you go into arbitration? It's because there's a prior contract that forces you to, in, to go into arbitration. Okay? Let me show you one example here. And mediation, of course, probably can go into mediation and uh, uh, it's okay if you don't settle. And you can just leave, you can come back. And uh, usually mediation goes is there are two different rooms. You and your client sit in one, one room and the opposing party sits in a different room. And the mediation comes in back and forth. Okay. And all the communications in mediation is confidential. It cannot be used later on in the trial. So that's how you in encourage people to settle. So this is, this is a shareholder agreement I drafted for a holding company in China. So what happened is my client from San Francisco okay, is forming a new corporation in Hong Kong with his partners. Okay. Now if you look at provision number 16, this applicable law and settlement of disputes, this governs if there is a dispute, what do we ha how do we handle it? Here, 16.2. Any dispute should be settled by arbitration through ICDR, that's International Center of Dispute Resolution, at San Francisco, California, United States. The agreement should be interpreted by the law of Hong Kong. Okay? Arbitration should, uh, should consist of three arbitrators and they are appointed by this list rules and language of the arbitration should be in English. Now, what do you think I put it this way? I wrote it. <coughs> the company is in Hong Kong. All right, so the law must be using the Hong Kong's law. Okay? But 
First of all, why do you think I said the language of appreciation must be in English? Because they can't change. But why do I say English? Why do I say Chinese? Because my clients speak English. It's better for my client. Okay, my client is here. English is first language. Then why do you think I pick San Francisco, California, United States? They have to, if there's a dispute, they don't go to arbitration in Hong Kong. They come to arbitration here in California. What do you think in California? It's better for the client because this is his home. Okay, he was born and raised in the United States. Okay, it's more comfortable for him to be here. But why San Francisco? Why not LA? Why not Seattle? Why not New York, uh, Washington DC? Why not New York? Courts will favor. The courts will favor. Yeah, well, the court will favor him because he's a United States citizen. But, and we don't go to court, we go to arbitration. Okay? That's not the reason. But I, why do I pick San Francisco? That's where you live? No. <laughs> <laughs> Who draft the agreement? <laughs> if the arbitration is here in San Francisco, if he has to hire a lawyer to go to arbitration, if the arbitration is here in San Francisco, who do you think he will hire? It will be me, right? Because I draft this. If the arbitration is New York, I'm probably not going to go. But if it's San Francisco, you'll probably hire me. So that's why. San Francisco. So they only hired you to write to write this together? No, I wrote this. They hire you. You do it. No, you paid me to draft this. Yeah. I do have to issue a hundred grand. But they, they want to become the law of other, other nations to run here too? Yeah. Well, they, they so they remember the shareholder agreement is the internal here. constitution of a corporation. Okay, you have to follow. You have to follow the shareholder agreement. That's the law that governs the international law. Hmm? The international law. You got that too. Hmm? The international law. Well, now this is the law within the company. Anything happens, we have to follow, follow, follow this uh, this uh, shareholder agreement. It's either bylaws and shareholder agreement. <laughs> All right. And then we go to mediation. Okay. Or that would be appreciation. Okay. Now. Uh, if you look at a commercial lease agreement, there a lot of times there is a provision that says arbitration. We have a lot of arbitration, except this happened. So always read the agreement very carefully. And mediation. So this, so mediation arbitration, or this process is called ADR, alternative, okay, dispute resolution. And uh, that's why majority of the cases, more than 95% of the case, settle before they go to trial. Okay? When you, people get out of a mediation, when people settle their case, nobody is happy. Okay? Nobody is happy. Okay? But they're satisfied. The reason you go to mediation, the reason you settle a case is you can control you can control how much you lost, you can control how much you win. When a case goes to trial, there are several reasons people don't like the case to go to trial. One, it's unpredictable. You never know how jury is going to rule. You never know how judge is going to rule. And it's very expensive. Okay? Just by judging attorney's fees, you're looking at $5,000 to $8,000 a day paying attorney's fees. Okay, it's very expensive. Any questions? Okay. Now, if the case don't settle, they go to trial. So what happened at trial? You guys watch Law and Orders, it's pretty much the same thing. Okay. There's an opening statement. At the opening statement, the lawyer will come up and say, we're going to prove this. Okay. We'll prove this. Very we will prove, we'll prove the evidence will show buried 
hit Melissa with a cold heart. Okay? He beat him, and he beat her with a baseball bat that caused severe injury, and we have proof for that. Okay? So you, you have some conclusions, and then you will say, we'll prove the case. And of course, you know, Barry's lawyer is going to come up and say, well, he's going to prove his case that Barry didn't do it. And then the case starts. So as plaintiff, we're going to call access. We're going to call witnesses first. We're going to call our witness. So we start asking our witness the questions. OK? Melissa, in this case, will be our star witness. We're going to save her for the last. OK? We'll be probably asking for your neighbors, whoever saw the head the the, uh, the, uh, the incident occurred, happened. All right. So we ask the question in, um, in a direct way. So this witness can tell us the entire story. Okay. When I'm done, Barry, the defendant's attorney, is going to cross our witness with random questions. So basically just poke holes to see if there's any contradictory. Okay. And then we're going to go to witness after witness, and sometimes expert witness. Then we're done with our witness, Barry's attorney is going to call your witness, and you're going to start to wrap your witness. And we're done, it's my turn to cross your witness. Okay, holds again. It goes back and forth. So when both parties are done presenting their case, that's it. Then we do our closing argument. That's when you can say nasty stuff, because there's nobody stand up and object to your questions. There's nobody stand up and object to your answers. Okay, so remember when we do a cross and, 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 and direct ex examination, <coughs> that's what we see on TV. Objections, Your Honor. Here's it. Objection, Your Honor. Argumentative. Compound questions. Okay. So now we're done. Okay, and then either the jury will render a decision or the judge will give you a judgment. Okay. Now, and after trial, there are a couple motions you can do. So I was watching Law and Order, one of the episodes. So in that episode, what happened was there is a mentally challenged girl. I believe she, she was 17 or 18 year old, OK? And she had a sexual intercourse with two of the boys, a younger boy, 16 or 17. Now, because she, as a mentally challenged person, she has no legal capacity to enter into a consensual sexual relationship. Okay? So the two boys was being prosecuted for the charge of rape. Okay? Any questions so far? And jury didn't like the boys, but the judge did. And then more than once, this girl testified in the court that she wanted this to happen. That she wanted to have intercourse with the boys. She wanted to prove her value to her class. She wanted to prove her, herself to the family and friends. She wanted to do it more than once. Okay. But at the end, jury found two boys guilty of rape. Okay. Because by law, it doesn't matter what she says. Okay? She has no capacity, legal capacity, to consent to a sexual relationship. Okay? And of course, the jury think the boys took advantage of the girl, which it was true. But at the same time, the girl didn't say no. The girl actually liked it. Like one that could happen. And well, jury comes back with the verdict. Okay? And the judge look at it and say, well, judge read out loud the verdict. The boys were uh, convicted. And at the same time, the judge asked the defense attorney, the two boys attorney, do you have a motion to file? So the, the attorney paused for two seconds, and then he stood up. 
and he filed an oral argument to set aside the judgment. Okay? A motion to set aside judgment. Motion to To set aside set the judgment. Aside, yeah. And the judge granted right away. That means the verdict is being vacated. Okay? The judgment has been set aside. And the boys are free to go. Okay? So these are type of motions we consider as <coughs> post-trial motions. Okay? You can ask the judge to set aside the, 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 the judgment. So what if you, 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 you what if the judge didn't do it? What if there's no other motions ready to file and you lost the case? What do you do? You can appeal your case to the Court of Appeals. Okay. Now, when you go to the Court of Appeal, what they do is there's no trial. They don't cross or they don't direct exam your witness. So what you do is your lawyer and the other party's lawyer will write a lengthy brief, okay? 50, 100, 200 pages. And then submit it to the court, okay? The, ju the judge will read the brief and then set a hearing date. And the hearing date, your attorney goes up at several minutes and you're done. The other attorney is gonna go up and present their case for a few minutes. And sometimes you have a chance to do another one rebuttal, and just a couple times, and that's it. That's called an appeal. Everything is decided on paper. And the judge only look at looking for any legal error. They only look into the question of the law to see if, there any, if there's any error when the law was applied. They do not question the facts. Okay? And when they read the case, Without being in your court, there's a, a court reporter that has everything that you that you court reporter, and um, the report is called the transcript. So the entire court of appeal, the appeal process is based on this transcript and the briefs prepared by the lawyers. Okay. If the the judge thinks there is a mistake in the fact, the judge will have a few, a few options the judge will send the, the case back to trial. Retry the case. Or at least retry this issue. Okay? Or they can say, I'll reverse the judgment. Guilty, now becomes not guilty. Or reverse in part. Some, you're still guilty, some of them you're not guilty. Or liable or not liable if it's a civil case. Okay? So that's what uh, the Court of Appeal, they can do. Okay. They can even dismiss the case. Sorry. Any questions? For the test. Let me think about it. I sent you an email about the test uh, before, the, before Sunday. How is that? Okay. So are there only two no, there, there are a lot. Of there are other ones. There's a lot of motion that you can do. I have a book sitting on the uh, on my desk about this thing, and that's just pre-trial motion. Pre-trial motion. Pre-trial motion. Yes. Yes. We cover two days already. Yes. Okay. This is chapter three. We'll be covering. Right. Chapter one. Chapter one and chapter three. Chapter one, chapter one. Chapter one and chapter three. It's open book. Yes. I don't, I don't know. Why you guys are so bad?